And so these seven deadly sins we've been sharing uh, came about in the mid-centuries, actually. It was Pope Gregory who uh, commissioned some biblical scholars to look at what issues most significantly impact a person's relationship with God. And so they started researching and studying, and, and uh, this list came about. And, and they called these the seven deadly sins, or capital sins, actually, uh, you may have heard them referred to. And that came out of the Latin word at that time, caput, which meant head or beginning. In other words, these sins were big deal sins because they were trigger sins. Uh, when we get angry, it causes us to do other stuff. When I lust, I, 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 if I'm not careful, I end up making bad choices. There are other sins that get triggered by these sins. Now, now you and I know from a biblical perspective... That sin is sin is sin. All sin is spiritually damaging. All sin is equal in that it cuts us away from God. There isn't one sin that somehow is greater than another sin in what it does in our relationship with God. However, we also know that not all sin is created equal in the ramifications in our lives. Not all sin is equal in the chaos it creates. Not all sin is equal in the mess that happens around us. And so these deadly sins were identified, and anger was the first week, and then envy, and gluttony, and lust, and this week pride. Next we're going to talk about sloth, or laziness, and then we'll end with greed. And, and these sins do trigger a lot of stuff in our lives, and, and many would say that pride actually is the root of all of those sins. That, that self-centered selfishness, that desire that we're going we're gonna to drive our own boat, we're going to manage our own life, we're going to make our own choices, we're going to be large and in charge, we are the king, queen of our castle. And, and that all sounds good until we start getting caught up in the stuff, the resulting chaos that happens with some of our choices. Now, this pride, this deadly pride, isn't that, that sense of uh, feeling good about something you've done or, or, or maybe saying to a friend or a coworker or a child, I'm proud of you. It's not that. This is that pride that's, that's much deeper and more narcissistic for us. It, it digs into our lives. And as a result, we sin. Now remember what we started with, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 said this about sin. For the wages of sin, our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Sin is sin is sin, but pride triggers a lot of other sin in our lives. And the Apostle Paul captured it in Galatians, the fifth chapter. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn there. Galatians, kind of the middle of your New Testament. And in Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about what pride creates in our lives, the kinds of behaviors, the sin that results uh, that come out of pride. And I'm going to start down in verse 19, and I want to read it for you out of the message version, because uh, Peterson, in such colorful way, kind of captures what Paul is saying uh, in this language. Here's what he says, verse 19, Galatians 5. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an inability to love or be loved. Divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of communion. And then he says this, and I could go on. In other words, hey, I'm just getting started here. And here's the kind of mess, here's the kind of crud that shows up in your life because pride messes with our hearts. Pride creates resulting havoc around us because of the choices we end up making, the decisions that it takes us down the path of. When we get so focused on ourselves, we lose sight of everything else. Now, pride's that sense of feeling better than someone else. But it's also not being able to take any joy in somebody else's accomplishments. Pride uh, hits us in so many different ways. But when pride becomes an excessive admiration of ourselves, 
We get in trouble. Now, pride has always been a, an issue in humankind. But today, because of social media, uh, we get to see it a lot, don't we? I mean, it, I mean, it like shows up everywhere for us. I mean, you go on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or anything, and, and what is it about? It, it is about, like, like, I need to borrow your phone for a second. Give me, or, sir, see, it's right here next to him. Okay, let, I thought we'd do a selfie. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> because everybody cares, don't they? <laughs> you you want to know where I am, and you, you want to know what I ate. For dinner last night you care what I think about LeBron James going back to Cleveland don't you it matters a great deal so what do we post we post all of this stuff about ourselves it focuses around us it centers around us the world is about me well maybe not <laughs> but that's not how I see it I think you're interested in what I'm interested in. I think you're interested in what I do. I want you to know. And so we post it all over the place. Pride, pride becomes this huge issue in our lives that creates such impact. Now, there's a lot of reasons we shouldn't feel very proud about stuff, right? There's things we do. Uh, th this last week, we were at the North American Christian Convention. It's a gathering of churches like ours that happens annually. Two years ago, our church uh, was responsible for uh, hosting it, putting on it. It was down in Orlando. This year, it was in Indianapolis. And, and uh, we had a great week. It was a great conference. And uh, on uh, Friday, when it was over, Diane dropped me off at the airport. Uh, I was uh, flying back home. I was coming home earlier than she was. And, and uh, now, I, I travel some. And I know how to travel <laughs> I, I mean i i know how we're i don't i don't actually i hate to say this, i don't actually like traveling with anyone else i, I don't want to i don't mind meeting my family somewhere i don't necessarily want to travel with them on the way to because they don't know how to really travel like i know how to travel when we take a group of people like we do to greece or israel i there i have to suspend i go on a drug therapy thing ahead of time like a month because i have to suspend everything there is about me that I know how to travel. So I get out at the airport in Indianapolis and I'm, I got my, um, I had already checked in for my flight. I had it downloaded uh, on my app, on my United app. It was, uh, I, I'm TSA pre-check. If you don't have that, you're going to want to have that. I came in the line and there was a big line of people, all those sheep over there going through security and there was a little TSA pre-check, no one there. I got my app, I'm ready to go, got my little bag. I walk up, I show my ID, I slap my phone on the thing Bam, the red light comes up. Well, that's because the guy there had done something not probably right, I'm assuming. And so I didn't read it right. I pulled my phone off and put it back up and boom, it went red again. He said, are you TSA? Oh, I'm, yeah. Sure. I'm like, yeah. You want my global entry number? And the guy said, well, uh, you're not ticketed um, out, out of here today. I said, I I'm two. I'm going to Denver. I'm on your five o'clock flight. Flight three, four, four. Look at it again. He said, I think maybe you should look at your boarding pass. I had the right destination. I had the right time. I had the right gate. Wrong city. <laughs> I have no idea how I did this. I actually thought I was in Louisville all week long. I, was, I didn't know what was going on with that. I saw these pictures a little while ago about you only got one job. You think you could get it right. Look at this. The guy who made up the medals for this event. <laughs> Proud to bring that home to your kids. Hey, Mom, look, I'm thirst. Uh, I love this one. That's Africa, by the way, in case you're missing. All right. Hey, kids, get your back-to-school hunting knives, right? That's awesome. I was told to paint the yellow lines next to the curb. I'm going to paint the yellow lines. <laughs> midfield logos usually go on the midfield. <laughs> yep. How often do you get a guy named Name here? Uh, that, uh, that's the, yeah, uh, take a look at this one. <laughs> I love this one. What's wrong with this picture? The bowl is in the milk. That's not how cereal works, right? <laughs> You only get one job, and sometimes we don't do it so well. Pride. 
Now, there's a level of pride that's vanity. It's that level that says, I think too much about what you think of me. And so I spend a lot of time trying to adjust around how you perceive me and think of me. That's vanity. There is a deeper level that's apathy, actually, and that's that I think too little of you or the things around me. But there is a worse level, and that is that deadly level, and that it's when it's self-absorbing. When, when people and things exist for what I want, what I need, what I think, how I feel... And what does deadly pride do to us? Well, there's probably hundreds of things, but I, I thought of five that, that were big deal impactors. The first is it gives me a false view of reality, doesn't it? When, when I'm looking through my lens of how I see life and how I want things to go and how I think you should be and how I think I just heard what you said and how I think what you did, what it meant to me. When I go through that, my view of reality gets distorted. I wear contact lenses, and I was in for my annual checkup, and uh, one, my right eye improved a little bit, so we were changing my lens, and, and I have a small stigmatism there, and so there's a rotation on my lens. I, I, he gave me the new lens to try. I put it in that morning, and it didn't feel quite right, but I know when you put something new in it, maybe, maybe it'll adjust. So I went all day long, and all day long I was having this kind of like, like whoa thing going on. It was like, man, things just didn't, it wasn't bad, but it didn't feel right. It was, it just, so finally I called and said, hey, I need to have you check this. And we discovered the manufacturer had actually done something. The lens didn't actually rotate the proper way. So I was spending uh, 24 hours looking like, whoa. It just, and that's what pride does to us. Things are just a little off. We view how others around us are reacting or doing things based on how our selfishness perceives it. It gives me a distorted view of reality. It mars my relationships, doesn't it? My friendships, my work relationships, my relationships with family, my marriage, my kids. And I doubt there's anybody here in the room who hasn't been impacted by somebody's phenomenally selfish behavior. And what that did in your life. It mars our relationship. It limits my opportunities. If the world is only as big as me, that's a pretty small world, isn't it? But a lot of us walk around as if somehow we're the center of everything. It shrinks my heart. In an effort to make myself look bigger, to be cooler, to be self-lifting, to enlarge myself, I end up shrinking my heart because here's what happens. Pretty soon nobody can get in because it's all about me. But the biggest thing pride does, deadly pride, is it keeps me from Jesus. That's what pride is, really. It's saying, God, I got this. I, 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 I'm good to go here. There's really kind of two ends to that. There is this end down here where I was for a long time and and I know a whole bunch of us get caught there. It's where I don't really need God. I, I can explain him away. I, I don't need that crutch to get me through life. I, I, don't need, I, I don't need what seems to me like a bunch of stuff that is trying to keep me from being happy. Only to discover the stuff I'm doing is making me miserable. I just don't need God. I want to do life my way. That's a bad spot. There's an equally... That's why, in fact, Jesus condemns this place more than the person who says they don't need God. And that's, that's those of us who are spiritually proud. We think we've arrived somehow. We got our act together. We are better than others around us. Just look around. We compare ourselves and we know more. We, we've studied the Bible more. We memorized more scripture. We, we've taken some theology stuff. We, we, we kind of got the God thing down. We've arrived. And it often ends up being so much about our head and not much about our heart. And don't misunderstand, God's not inviting me to an empty-headed faith. He's inviting me to grow and learn and have my mind be changed and transformed. But the problem is this. Sometimes you and I land in the place where, where we are so spiritually arrogant that we actually are in the same spot that guy is in. I don't need God. I got this. My pride keeps me from Jesus. 
Keeps me from recognizing my need. Keeps me from recognizing how broken and busted I am. Keeps me from recognizing the messes I make. Keeps me from recognizing that I can't fix myself. Now, I'm going to get this. So at the end of this section that Paul gives in Galatians 5 about all the things that pride leads us to, here's what he invites us to, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, he says, is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those characteristics, those, those attributes, those come when we humble ourselves and allow God to get engaged in our lives. And then we live like in this fertile soil where there's this orchard that bursts all these kinds of fruits in our lives. All the things that would make us attractive happen in the soil of humility, Paul says. When we recognize our need, when we come before him, I heard this week about a church that in their parking lot to try to help people know where they parked, put fruit of the spirit signs up. So like you parked in kindness or patience or goodness. And he said, he said, I'd have trouble going to church there. I mean, you know, pulling in, fighting with my wife, all hey, you know, where'd you park kindness? <laughs> you know? <laughs> He said, and I, and I don't know what behind the church, maybe they had the seven deadly sins back there, you know. Hey, where are you parking today, lust? You know? <laughs> I was going to park in gluttony, but those guys are taking up two spots. So, <laughs> How is it that we allow this grace of God to flow into our lives? I, I love the questions Jesus asked. If you flip back a few pages to the Gospel of John, John chapter 5, there's a terrific little scene here. Jesus and his followers are heading into the city of Jerusalem. I want to pick it up in verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. And it was surrounded by five covered colonies. And here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. So here, here's the history of this. Uh, Jerusalem was this great walled city and there were a number of gates. One of those was the Sheep Gate. It was the Commerce Gate. It was where a lot of marketplace stuff happened. Inside that gate were these pools, natural pools, that they had built some stone structures and covered porches, uh, covered roofs over these. Uh, they call the pools of Bethesda. And, 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 and Bethesda is where we actually get the word for uh, Bethesda hospitals, Bethesda nursing care, a place of healing. But see, here was the legend. That, that when the water stirred, it was because an angel dipped into the water... And whoever got into the water first would be healed from whatever they had. And we know from history that hundreds of people with emotional issues and physical issues and all kinds of health stuff going on would stay by these pools all day long waiting for the water to stir, hoping they would be the first one in to be healed. And Jesus and his followers come through this gate and they pass by. Now, the very first time I read this, I remember thinking it didn't happen like this. I, I, they, someone wrote this down wrong. Uh, here's what happens. Uh, when Jesus saw him, uh, wait, let me back up uh, to verse 5. One was there who'd been an invalid for 38 years. He was, we don't get any information about this guy. We don't get his name. We don't get his family history. We don't, we don't know, was this a, a birth disease, childhood disease? Was this industrial accident? All we know was he'd been unable to walk for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked the man, do you want to get well? This is where I had the disconnect moment. Because everything I'd heard about Jesus up to this point in my life was that he was kind and merciful and graceful and generous. And, and so... Uh, that kind of person would have walked up and chatted the guy up and learned about his family. And, you know, he wouldn't have done the New York thing. Hey, you want to walk? I mean, uh, why else would this guy be at this pool? That's what he was there for. Do you want to get well? I thought it was an unbelievably rude question to ask. Yes or no question, isn't it? Do you want to get well? Yes, I do, or no, I don't. Listen to his answer. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. You hear what he said? <laughs> you want to get well? I would if I could, but I can't, so I'm not. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. I've been um, doing this people thing a long time now. And uh, 
I, I can't recall a week that I haven't had somebody say to me, I, I want my life to be better. I, 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 I want my marriage to be better. I like to get past this anger issue. That I've got this, this thing that's con- spiraling out of control, this addiction in my life. I, I don't like my job. I, I don't like how I'm with my kids. I, I just want to get better. I want to be well. And it's being straight up, I want to say, yeah, right. You don't want to get well. What you want, what you want is the pain you're feeling right now to go down. And when that pain goes back down to some manageable level for you, you'll go back to doing whatever it was you were doing that got you in this spot to begin with. Because I know it's true for me. I, I, I don't change when I see the light. I change when I feel the heat. That until the pain of staying like I am is greater than the pain of me making some change, I'm not likely to change. Because when Jesus asked the question, do you want to get well? Here's what he was saying to the guy. Your life is going to change. How you've been living, what you've been accustomed to, your circle of friends, how you've been, how you've been uh, providing for yourself, all of that is going to change. Do you want that? And the truth is, a lot of times I don't. And until the pain of staying like I am is greater than the pain of whatever change I'm going to make, more than likely, I live with the chaos. What I thought was a rude question is a really good question Jesus asked. Do you want to get well? Do you, do you want to fix the hole in your heart? And his invitation It's for me to get past being a self-absorbed jerk and humble myself and admit my stuff and recognize my issues and come to Him. We do baptisms all the time around here, but in a couple weeks we're going to do the pools outdoors. and, And it is an opportunity for us to humble ourselves. The Bible doesn't promise that the stuff in my life is just going to somehow be gone because it took me a lot of years to create some of those issues. It might take me a while to unwind some of those, but he does promise that he will flood my life, flood my life with his grace, that no no matter how selfish I've been, no matter how much chaos I've created, No matter how far from home I've gone, he extends his grace and forgives me and invites me to live in his hope and his presence and his peace and to get a new life. Do you want to get well? Well, maybe we do. Maybe we don't.